Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning's message, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, is taken from the 37th chapter of the book of the prophet Ezekiel, today's Old Testament lesson, especially with the first three verses where once again they read, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. This is our text, dear family and friends in Christ Jesus. Amen. Have you ever heard that, that children's song that goes something like, the toe bone's connected to the ankle bone, the ankle bone's connected to the shin bone, the shin bone's connected to the leg bone. Oh, come on, I opened myself up for that. Hear the word of the Lord. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, we all, well, I thought we all knew it, but uh, maybe it's just in presentation. You had no idea what I was talking about. But that, that's a cute a little children's song uh, that, that we have heard and that we taught our kids over the years. And I tell you, uh, this song, as cute as it may be, it really points to one of the most uh, dramatic, hopeful uh, images that is found in the Old Testament as it brings to mind Ezekiel's vision of the valley of dry bones. And today, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel tells us, he said, I was set in the middle of a valley that was filled with bones. And looking at it, uh, it's, it's not exactly clear whose bones these were. Who knows, maybe they were the ar an army that had been trapped and defeated in that, va in that valley uh, by, uh, by some uh, terrible hostile forces. But it's not exactly sure, it doesn't exactly say what's going on, but regardless, it tells us that the flesh had been gone from these bones for some time. And there was nothing left except for this, this pile of, of large bones that had been baked by the sun. And in Ezekiel's own words, he tells us that these bones were very dry. And then among this, this scene of death and decay and destruction, the Lord then asks Ezekiel a question. He says, Son of man, uh, can these bones live? And really, that's a helpful question for all of us to consider here today. With that in mind, think about this. There's that couple that is sitting in the office of a counselor who had been struggling in their relationship for quite some time, and they find the courage and ask the counselor, can our marriage be saved? Is it possible that we will be able to stay together? Or there's that patient that is sitting in the doctor's office waiting patiently and the doctor comes in and, and they hear the word cancer and they can't help but ask the question, what are my chances, doc? Will I survive? Will I be able to make it? Or there's that elderly widow who sinks in her chair after just a few hours earlier she saw her, her husband of 60 years casket be lowered into the ground and she can't help but wonder, can I possibly go on? Can I make it each day without him? It's true, isn't it? There's a lot of people out there living in this world of ours who are basically living in that valley of dry bones. With that in mind, have any of you heard the story of Charles Plum? Uh, he's, it's really an amazing, inspirational story when you make your way through his book. He wrote a book entitled, I'm No Hero. But I'll tell you this, there's a guy who most definitely was in the valley of dry bones. Now, Charles Plum, if you do not know, he was a, a pilot uh, in the Vietnam War. And he had flown many successful missions, but uh, after one particular, in, during one particular mission, his plane was hit by enemy fire, uh, crash landed, and, and he was captured by the enemy. Uh, and from that point on, for the next six years, his home was an eight by eight 
cell that had a dirt floor, nothing but a tin can to serve uh, as his toilet. Charles Plum was then tortured on a, on a regular basis by his captors doing all kinds of painful and unthinkable things to his body. And as all these different things were being done to him day after day after day, he couldn't help but be overwhelmed by it all and he thought over and over again, I just can't take it anymore. I cannot make it anymore. But somehow, some way, he mustered enough strength from within uh, uh, each moment of torture to survive. And then one day when he was in that 8x8 eight eight cell, he noticed that from underneath uh, the wall that was made of bamboo that was there, underneath it came a wire. And it was wiggling back and forth as if to give him a signal. But, but he had been through too much torture for too long uh, to give in to that, fearing that the worst might happen because of that. But finally, after several days of seeing that take place over and over again, he finally found the courage to go ahead and tug that wire. And then when he did do that, he found out that the wire was, was in the hands of, a, of another prisoner, and they, they attempted to scratch out letters on the sand or on the dirt floor to try and communicate to each other, asking each other questions. And he soon discovered that there were uh, over 200 other men who were being brutalized just as he was. He was not alone. Then, as if all that wasn't enough, when he finally was released, when he finally made his way back home to San Francisco, the first thing that he did was, was uh, uh, make a phone call in an attempt to, to locate and, and find his wife after all those years of being separated from her and he called, but, but without any success whatsoever. And then his next call was to his father, and he talked to his father, and his father came and, and saw him, and he had the unfortunate task to tell him that his wife had left him. And after all that, his dad then said, come on home, son. It's a new day. Let's, let's start fresh. Think about that. All that this man had been through was a new, fresh start even possible? tell you this, that living in the middle of that, he did not really think that that was possible. And as we reflect on that, it's safe to say that many, many people, do they not, live in the valley of dry bones? Maybe not to the extent of Charles Plum, but in their own situation, their own circumstance. And, and it's true that, that some people are dwelling in that valley for a long, long time and others dwell in that valley for a much shorter period of time. But I'll tell you this, it doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, or, or where you are in life, that all of us live and dwell in that valley of dry bones from time to time. Don't we? Well, as we reflect on today's gospel lesson, we find that, that Mary and Martha, that they likewise were in that valley of dry bones when their brother, when their beloved, when, when he died, Lazarus as we saw in today's gospel. and They sent for Jesus, and Jesus was delayed, and, and in the process, uh, now Lazarus was in the tomb for four days, and we're told that fact, basically saying it's beyond hope. There's no turning back now. He is dead. There's absolutely nothing that you can do about that. And, and for that, that time, Mary and Martha were living in that valley of dry bones. And as I scan the crowd here today, I know that many of you over the course of time with me being here have been in that valley from time to time. And I also know that some of you are in that valley, that lonely, difficult valley right now. But again, we're all going to be there. And when we are there, when we are in that lonely valley, do we not find ourselves asking the question, is there any hope? Can I go on? Will these bones ever really live again? I want to tell you here today, without any doubt, without any question, that with a loud resounding, yes, there is hope. Yes, you can make it. Yes, these bones will live again. And with that, you might immediately follow with the next question that certainly makes sense and then say, the question, how? How is that possible? How can we find hope in the middle of des desolation? How can we find courage in the face of impending doom? How can we find comfort in, in, when we are stuck in the middle of our ultimate distress? Well, the answer may seem a little simplistic, 
but it's absolutely, totally true. And that is, I can assure you that we find hope, that we find courage, that we find comfort in the word of the Lord. Take a look again at today's Old Testament reading where, where God says to the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And, and uh, he answered, Oh Lord, only you know. You are the only one who really knows that. And then again, the Lord responded and said, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. You see, our answer, as simplistic as it may seem, is found in the word of the Lord. For God's word is an extremely powerful thing. Remember, it was with a word that, that God created and brought everything in, in this universe into being. God said, let there be light, and there was light. It was by a word that God revealed the fullness of his, his divine love for all of humanity as the word became flesh and blood and dwelt among us. And it was by a word that, that Christ brought Lazarus back from the dead, as, as we saw in this morning's gospel lesson. It continued a little bit longer where, where Jesus, standing in front of the tomb, with a loud voice cried out, said, Lazarus, come out! And he came out with his hands and his feet bound with bandages and his face wrapped with a cloth. And I'll tell you this, it is by the word of the Lord that we live and move and have our very being. Our hope, found in the word of the Lord. And that's why scriptures are, or at least why, why the scriptures should be so important and valuable uh, to each and every one of us. And yet, so often, we miss this great source of power and, and help that is found in the scriptures so that what, because when, when challenges come, when heartaches take place, and, and these difficulties happen in our life, it seems as if we look everywhere else for the solution to those problems instead of God's word. And when we do that, when we look everywhere else, we find that ultimately we are looking in the wrong places because they are not going to be able to provide that help that we need. Now, Catherine Mansfield. Uh, you may or may not have heard that name. Uh, she's one who was a, a brilliant writer, uh, and she died at a relatively early age of tuberculosis. And it wasn't until she was nearing death that she, uh, that she finally was introduced to the Bible. Prior to that, she had never read the Bible once. She had never heard anything about it, never studied it all until uh, as she was well, rapidly approaching death. And then, after she read it, after she found the words that are powerful in God's word, uh, she wrote the following in her journal. She said, I feel so sad that I have never known these writings before. They should have been a part of my very being. They should have been a part of my very being. That's true for us, too, isn't it? Even when, maybe especially when we are found in that valley of dry bones. You see, friends, we need the written word of God, and in it, we are able to find that comfort and strength that we are so desperately looking for and searching for. So this means that, that when you are depressed, instead of locking yourself in your house or, or locking everybody else out, what you need to do is unlock the hope and the help that is found in God's word. When when you're discouraged, rather than giving in and, and quitting and, and throwing in the towel and just ending it all, look for the hope and the comfort that is found in, in God's word. When we are lonely, we feel like we're all by ourselves and nobody is there to, to give us the encouragement and help that we need. Instead of becoming upset and soured by it all, be assured what a friend we have in Jesus. When all the pressures of the world seems to be mounting upon us and it seems like we just can't take it anymore, rather than giving in to defeat and settling for that, take it to the Lord in prayer. For as we do, we'll find great comfort and hope. We'll be reminded over and over again of the great love that God has for us that, that reclaims or recalls that story that we know oh so well of the depth of his love, how far he was willing to go to give that which was most precious to him, his very son, to come down here to earth. Thus, we have Jesus dying on the cross for you and me. One final thing here to kind of pull this all together. There's a Christian author by the name of Bruce Larson. And some time ago, he wrote this book entitled Believe and Belong. And, and it gives a great illustration, I think, to kind of help tie it all together is what I'm talking about here this morning. 
He tells of this uh, huge statue of Atlas in the entrance of the RCA, the former RCA building there on Fifth Avenue in New York City, Rockefeller Plaza, 30 Rock as we know it uh, today. And, and there, uh, you see it up on the screen, uh, you have Atlas, uh, this perfectly formed male, this strong, muscular man holding up uh, the world uh, on his shoulders. And even though he is the most powerful man on the face of the earth, he still can barely stand up under the weight, under the pressure, under the difficulty of, of that burden. And Larson then says, <clears throat> that's one way to live your life, to try and carry the world on your shoulders all by yourself. And then he continues on, he said, on the other side of Fifth Avenue is St. Patrick's Cathedral. And behind the high altar there, is this little statue of Jesus, boy Jesus. He's about eight or nine years old. Not sure if you can see it or not, but with no effort whatsoever, he's holding the world in one of his hands. Larson then says, basically, we, we have a choice. We can carry the world on our shoulders all by ourselves, or we can say, I give it up to you, Lord. I give you all of my pressures. I give you the world. I give you the whole world. And I'll tell you this. It is in this brief hour of worship that we spend together each and every week where we shift our burdens from our shoulders into the loving hand of Jesus. We find our strength, our help in the word of the Lord. That's why scriptures are so important. That's why we're encouraging you to spend some time uh, this year reading it on a regular basis. Because you're going to find a strength and a peace that you're just not going to find anywhere else. Isn't that awesome? There is indeed hope for all of us. Even when, and especially when, we are living in that, that dry valley, that valley of dry bones. Thanks be to God that he gives us that hope, that hope that we're just not going to be able to find anywhere else. In his name, amen. And now, may the peace of God, which far surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen.